Hey everyone, in this video I want to just provide a getting started with the Azure PowerShell. I'm not going to go into specific commands for specific functions, there's great documentation around each command. My focus is more around, well, how do I get started using it, um, the authentication, authentication it may be automation scenarios, and really where this has come from, and when should I be using it. So if I think about, well, we have Azure. And really, we're in kind of the V2 of Azure because we have the Azure Resource Manager arm. There was the ASM, the Azure Service Manager before, as kind of old, decrepit. We don't really want to touch that anymore. So with the Azure Resource Manager, and the primary interface to that is there's actually kind of this RESTful API. So there's a REST API. Now that API I may use if I was writing an application and want to interface with Azure. But for most of what we're going to do, we don't want to directly hook into the RESTful API. Now, if there's brand new functionality in Azure, sometimes it may only be available via the REST API. So we may need to actually directly interact with it. And I can do that through things like PowerShell. But more often, we're going to deal with something else that then talks to that RESTful API. Now, when we get started with Azure, often we think about, well, there's the portal. And of course, the portal fundamentally is talking to the RESTful API and getting results back. That's the portal.azure.com. Then I can think about various kind of command line interfaces. This could be for real-time interaction. It could be I want to script things to automate. So this could be things like the Azure CLI and also the AZ PowerShell module. So we have kind of two options there. And they're really functionally equivalent. And then, of course, we have templates. And with templates, we think about, well, we have this JSON-based ARM um, template. There may also be things like Terraform. We have things like Bicep now, and Bicep actually kind of compiles down to a JSON ARM um, template. And if we look at all of these different kind of options, they're all talking to that RESTful API. Now, the portal's great for kind of learning. It's good to kind of see what's going on. But I really should not be creating things in there. The CLI, well, that's great for kind of automation, stopping, starting, things like that. But once again, I don't really think about creating things. Templates are great for provisioning and changing configuration. And the reason we say this is I could all totally create things with CLI, with PowerShell, but it's not declarative, it's not idempotent, i.e. I'm telling it how to do something, not what I want the end state to be. So if I want to change the configuration, I can't just rerun the script. I have to use different commands to check, is it there already? Um, what's a command to change something? Whereas these templates, I can just rerun them as many times as I want. If it matches the end state, I don't have to do anything. If I change the template, it will make it so. And there's absolute kind of links between these things. So from the portal, for example, well, it can call Azure PowerShell through things like Azure Automation, through Azure Functions. So you can actually kind of see there are links. So like from the portal, hey, I can do this with automation, with functions. From an ARM template, I can call PowerShell. This could be within a VM using the custom script extension. And then if it's outside the VM, the last mile configuration, I can use deployment scripts. ARM templates, well, we have template specs in the portal to represent ARM. So there's this whole link between them, but they all have their strong points. The portal, Great to get this intuitive view of what's there, maybe look at monitoring data. The CLI is great for automation, maybe performing some management tasks. 
templates for provisioning, maybe modifying the configuration. So they all have their place. Obviously our focus today is on kind of this Azure PowerShell. But I did want to kind of just stress the point of where it's all kind of coming from. Now when we think about the PowerShell, and the same actually for the CLI, it is cross-platform. Now I'm going to really focus on PowerShell 7 Plus. So before there was Windows PowerShell, which went up to version 5, and then PowerShell Core, which was version 6, they've really merged together with version 7. It does, it's not called PowerShell Core 7, it's just PowerShell 7, but it is built on the core version. Now this is cross flat So obviously I have Windows, we have Linux, and we have kind of Mac OS. So I'm gonna recommend PowerShell 7, and I'm gonna recommend Visual Studio Code as kind of that editing experience. And once again, these Windows, Linux, Mac OS, this cross-platform actually applies to both of them. And the Azure CLI, that also is Win, um, Windows, Linux, Mac OS. So both of them are cross-platform, so don't have to pick one over the other because of the platform. They're both cross-platform. So I'm gonna focus on this PowerShell 7 VS Code. Now with PowerShell, functionality is provided with modules. And there's actually been kind of this evolution of the Azure PowerShell modules. So it started off, we can kind of think about, well, there was Azure. So we had the Azure module. Now remember, this was in the, the old days of kind of the Azure Service Manager. Well then, the Azure Resource Manager came along. And what they initially did is they actually set this up so you had this switch Azure mode. So I would change between ASM and ARM. And that was really not very friendly. It was not a pleasant thing we wanted to do. And so then what they introduced was kind of this Azure PowerShell 1.0 where they split the functionality. So Azure became ASM. For the ARM, we had Azure RM. So you can always think about when PowerShell is always least cognitive distance. What do I want to do? That's gonna be the command. And you have this verb noun. So I could think about with the Azure commands, it was kind of verb dash Azure noun. That's how it was structured. So I could say something like, well, get Azure VM. Whereas on the arm, it simply added RM to the commands. So we had this kind of verb dash Azure RM noun. So now we could have, well, get Azure RM VM. So that's how that would kind of map across. And then they've evolved it still. So that was kind of the Azure module, the Azure RM module, and what we actually have now is the AZ module. Now this is only ARM. So now we think about, well, it's, it's verb dash AZ, a bit clearer, now, i.e. get AZ VM. If you're already using Azure RM, um, there's actually kind of two different things uh, we can actually do. So the ideal one is there's a tools migration, az.tools.migration, that will convert your scripts that use Azure RM to start using AZ. So that's kind of going this way, we have kind of the tools. Or if I don't want to change my scripts today, there's actually a way that it creates aliases 
for all the AZ commands to Azure RM, so your scripts will kind of just carry on working. It's actually a kind of an enable alias option. We are going to focus on this. So it's only Azure Resource Manager. It's this AZ module. But I wanted to kind of understand the history of where it's come from. If you ever see Azure RM, the chances are you can just change it to just AZ using the new AZ module. But that's, that's what we're going to do. So what we'll actually do now is jump over to the environment and actually see some of these things in action. So obviously I'm using VS Code. Now I've got like a sample script I've put together here uh, in the link in the description of the video. You can go and get this from my random stuff GitHub repo. So if we look at this, there's different ways to actually get the PowerShell module. Now the easiest is with PowerShell get. This is built in and we can see here if I do look sort of a get command, what's in the PowerShell get module. There's all these various commands that are available to me, but there's things like um, find is available, find module, you can see that down here at the bottom. There are things around um, installing modules. You can see that here. And that's really what we want to focus on. Now, I can view the repositories that I've been configured to use, i.e. what I'm going to search. And by default, you're going to see kind of the PS gallery, the PowerShell gallery. There is also an MSI version available. Now, the benefit of the MSI version is when I install a new version with the MSI, it will actually remove the old version. Because one of the key points is this AZ module is actually a meta module. There's actually underneath it a whole set of az.compute, .network. There's a huge number of these. So if by default, when there's a newer version, if I go and just do an update module, it doesn't uninstall the old ones. So over time, I'll end up with a huge number of different versions. If I do the MSI-based installation, it will actually remove the previous version and just replace it with the new one. So that, that is a benefit to the MSI, but it's not that pleasant to actually use. It's fairly an interactive thing. So here what we're doing is, well, we can kind of see what do we have right now? So if I run this command, there's actually different commands I can use. I'm doing a get module on AZ, and I can see when I'm running 5.2. I could also get installed module and once again, I can see my version is 5.2. So I'm going to see that here. I can always check, well, what's available? What's the newest one? So if I do find module, what I'll see is there's actually a 5.3. Now at this point, I would go and uninstall the old one. That's how I handle this. Now if I just do a get module AZ, notice how many different kind of child modules there's are. So you can see there's the main AZ module, then it's .accounts, .advisor, .aks, these are all part of it. And you can see way, where they actually get installed. So if we scroll up just a little bit, we can see mine are installed in this C program files PowerShell modules. The reason for that is when I do my installations, I actually install them for all users. So it goes to my C program files, uh, PowerShell modules. If you don't do that, then the default is actually going to install it on the current user, and it will install it in the dollar home documents PowerShell modules, which I don't want. My documents is part of my OneDrive. I don't want that synchronized everywhere. You can see what your various areas are. So if I just look at, for example, my dollar env PS module path. These are all the places PowerShell goes and looks. Well, here we can see the default kind of the my user path is that first part. And then we can see kind of the all users part. Now I'm a version behind. I, I don't really care. But what I would do is if I did want to get up to date, I actually will uninstall all of the old modules. So I get a list of them and do an uninstall. You have to run this from an elevated PowerShell. So for example, if I just typed PowerShell, 
over here. You can see kind of I've got a PowerShell. I would right click and say run as administrator. That's now kind of checking. Hey, do you really want to run this elevated? And now get my screen back. There we go. It's running as administrator, so I could run those various commands. You have to run it elevated for both the install and kind of the remove. I'm not going to do that there. It would take too much time. But essentially, that would uninstall them. The other thing you could absolutely do, because they're just files, if I go and look at that path, we'll actually see, I've dragged that over, this is that folder. I could just delete the folders. These are the modules. I could just go and delete them and then do the install again. So that's my preferred approach. Um, you can do things like allow clobber, but then you're going to end up with multiple versions. Now, Microsoft do actually provide this script. I've got the link right here. With this script, it will go and uninstall a particular version or all but the most current version. So they do provide ways to clean up the environment if you do find yourself with multiple versions. But for me, I just go and delete the old ones first, and then I do the installation. Now, this is how I do the installation this first command. Notice I do scope all users. So that's going to install it in that C program files PowerShell modules path instead of my documents folder. And I actually install a whole bunch of them because I do things like the Azure resource graph. I interact with Azure tables a lot. I integrate with the Microsoft graph. PS read lines are a kind of nice utility to give me some AI based hints of what's coming along with the Azure specifically, the AZ Tools Predictor. The only one you absolutely need is this first one, the AZ module. If you did want to do an update, you can just run update module AZ. But again, then I'm going to end up with multiple versions. But you've done that. You've opened an elevated window. You've installed the AZ module. So you now have AZ on your system. I have here the link to the AZ Tools migration. So that's the module that I could use to convert my Azure RM scripts actually to AZ based scripts. And then the link to the document that tells you the two commands to prepare it and then do the conversion. I've also got the command to enable the Azure RM aliases for the AZ module. And you see it would go and add aliases for every single child module of AZ. So that's the first thing you have to do. So in terms of using kind of the AZ, step one is install it. Step two is to essentially I have to authenticate. So I, I do an auth n. Now this might be interactive. I, I'm sitting there and I want to authenticate. It might be I have some automation and it needs to authenticate. It might be it's something running in Azure and it wants to authenticate. So depending on what I'm doing, it's going to impact how I think about that authentication. Now, one of the key things here is we're used to in the past, we authenticate, we type in a username and password. We don't do that anymore. What actually happens for this, this is all based on tokens. So when I do this authentication, it's actually using a, a device code flow. I get a token that by default, I get an, a refresh token that's good for 90 days. Every time I use it, it's a rolling 90 days. So as long as I keep connecting, that token's never going to expire. I can close the session, I can reconnect, close, reconnect, close. I never have to do this again. It's going to keep that context and I can keep using it. So I only have to really authenticate once. So it's going to give me that refresh token, which by default is that 90 day rolling window. So if I'm interactive, let's go and have a look at this. It's going to use a browser control now. So if we just go and look, if I do connect AZ account and I just run that command, You'll notice what it did is it jumped over to the browser. It asked me which account I want to authenticate with. Oh, it just errored for some reason. 
It's gone to local host. Let's try that again. That's kind of weird. I lost internet for a second. I'll try that one more time. But I think I actually think it worked. So it's saying, hey, I launched browser, but I'll run that one more time. So hopefully it doesn't do some weird error thing, but it opens the browser. I could select a different account and they go all complete. You can now return to the application. So I didn't have to do anything. Now that works great, assuming the device that I'm running that command on can open a browser. Maybe I'm on a device that can't. So the other one we can actually use is this device code flow, where it will say, hey, go to this site and type in this code that will then link back to that session. And I can still manually do that. So if we go back over and I go back over here, you notice I have this option of use device authentication. What this will do is notice what it's saying. Go to this web page down here on the bottom, Microsoft.com device login, and then when it prompts you, type in this code to authenticate. So that could be on a completely different machine if, for example, this one doesn't have that ability. So I could just go to that site, what is the code? So I could type this in. And then it's going to do kind of the same thing again. What account do you want to use? Okay, yeah. John at Savile Tech, you're good. So that's kind of another way. If I can't do the browser interactively, I can do it that way. That's great for the interactive. Now notice there are other commands. Um, there's like add AZ account, there's login AZ account. They're all just aliases to connect AZ account. There's one command. Now, what if I'm not interactive? What if I'm actually running this as some kind of automation behind the scenes? I can't put in a credential. That's when we actually get in. We need to create an identity that can be used. And what that actually becomes is a service principle, and that's an application. So I create an application in my Azure AD, an app registration, and that app registration can have a secret and or a certificate. So now that app registration, I'm gonna authenticate as the security principle for that app registration, that service principle, via whatever I create, be it a secret, i.e. a password, um, or a certificate where there's a public private set. So I can think about, okay, there's my Azure AD. And ordinarily we have users. That's what I was just doing. Fine. If I need an automation, I'm gonna do an app registration. So now that app has kind of that, that secret or a certificate. And again, if it's a certificate, I keep the private part, I give it kind of the, the public. This knows how it can guarantee I really have that certificate, I really am that person. And if we look at the Microsoft documentation, it actually goes through um, how to do that. So if I jump over super fast, so here I've got this for an app. And if we follow that link, does the sign-in interactive, which I just showed, so you create the service principle, this new AD service principle, a name. By default, it's gonna use a secret if I don't do anything else. And that secret will actually get returned into this variable you specify. Or, again, you can use a certificate. And when you create this, if you actually go to your Azure AD and look at your app registrations, well, here you can see, for example, I created an RBAC test app registration. It's there as an app registration. And then from there, I can see if I have kind of certificates, I could create a new client secret, which I could use to then authenticate with. It will never show it to you again. Once you get that client secret, you need to keep it super safe. So when I think about, okay, I have an app that wants to authenticate to PowerShell, I do this app registration, and that app registration has that secret, i.e. a password, or it's using cert. Now the challenge if you go the secret path, where do you put the secret? I can't put it in my code, 
because it's not very secure. I end up publishing it to a GitHub repository and then there's a big problem. So if I take this approach, then really what we have to do is have some kind of vault. Now in Azure, that's Azure Key Vault, and I would store that and then my script would reference it. But you get a chicken and egg problem. How does my code authenticate to the vault to get the secret out? Uh, how do I do that? Um, cert, I have to still store that private cert somewhere securely, um, but I could have that maybe on the machine that's running that piece of code in an unexportable fashion, makes it harder to really manipulate. The other option is, if my app that's running this PowerShell is actually running in Azure, so I have some kind of resource, it could be a VM, it could be uh, an Azure function which can run PowerShell, I can have something called a managed identity. So then this resource actually has an identity in Azure AD and only that resource can make a call out to a special endpoint and it gets the token. It doesn't have to do anything else. It literally just says, hey, I'm this resource, give me my token. And for all of these, if it's a user, an app, a managed identity, I can do role-based access control the same way. I can give them access to all various resources, give them roles, nothing really differs there. This is all about how I actually do the authentication. But if I'm actually an Azure resource, I can turn on managed identity and then just within there, authenticate as that. So if we go and look here, we can see I've got this command, use managed identity. Now I'm not running in an Azure resource, so this won't work. But if I actually go and look at my portal and let's do something non-boring. Let's look at Azure Functions. So if I look at Azure Functions, they support managed identity. Now there's system assigned where it does all the work for me and there's user assigned. In this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and look at Savtech Azure Bingo. And what we'll actually see is I have turned on the identity. So this now actually has an identity in Azure Active Directory for this function. I could do it for VMs, really anything. And it actually does all the work for me. It automatically loads in the actual identity when the function starts up. If I go and look at app files for the Azure function, what we'll actually see behind the scenes, it has a profile.ps1 file. And notice the only thing it does, well, if there's a secret and the AZ accounts module is available, connect AZ account identity. If it has a managed identity, it automatically authenticates you with it. So if I'm running something in Azure and I want to use PowerShell and I need to authenticate to, to Azure because I want to do things against Azure, use managed identity and not having to worry about well, where do I put the secret, where do I do anything else, it just inherently is that identity when I turn that on. And now I can go and interact with kind of other Azure resources. So this is just authenticating. So we have these different ways to authenticate interactively as an application using the managed identity if I'm a resource running in Azure. So that's great. Well, then what do we do? So the next actual part is we may have access to more than one subscription. So you're gonna hear about contexts. And I can really think about a context as kind of the authentication, the token I'm using, and a particular subscription. It's kind of that combination of factors. So if we jump back over. Now also, I didn't really go into this. Imagine I have an account but I want to actually get a token against a different tenant. Imagine my account had actually been made a guest in another Azure AD instance, so it's been given roles there, and I actually need a token against that other tenant. Well, I can actually just pass the tenant name. So I can just very easily do, hey, connect easy account dash tenant, and then whatever that might be, savvletech.com, 
whatever that is. And as I mentioned before, once I've done that authentication, I now have that, that token. You saw me close this Visual Studio code and then reopen it. I, don't, I never have to re-authenticate again. As long as I'm using this at least once every 90 days, that rolling window is going to carry on and I stay authenticated. So while you might think, oh, this is a little bit of a pain in the neck having to do this weird authentication thing, well, A, it's not really a pain in the neck anymore with this new browser control. It was a bit of a pain in the neck with the device code. But even then, I typically do it once and then I kind of stay authenticated. So the next thing I now have is I have a context. So if I look at my context, I'm going against my Savile Tech Dev. That's the name of my context. And it's using my Savile Tech Dev subscription, subscription name. And it's going against kind of the Azure cloud. Now there are different clouds. Uh, if you actually do, for example, get AZ environment, you actually see there's different clouds. There's the regular commercial cloud, which is Azure cloud. Then there's one for China, there's one for Germany, and there's US government. government. Chances are you're using Azure Cloud, but that's part of your context as well. But you might have multiple contexts. When I do my authentication, my connection, it will actually preload a bunch of contexts. I think it's the first 25 that actually are available to me as that identity. So if I do a get az context, we can see I actually have three. Now, one of them is a different tenant. Now, by default, the names are really not that friendly. I'm going to show you a little trick in a second because I like to give them short names so I can switch between them very, very easily. Now, I can also look at my subscriptions. So now I can see the various subscriptions I have against various tenants. I could select particular subscriptions. But notice it's saying, well, what context? There isn't really a select AZ subscription command. Again, get AZ subscription. I should actually show this here. I'll put it in here. If I do get alias select AZ subscription, what do we think that is? It's set AZ context. So set AZ context lets me switch between them. Now, if you, if you run that get AZ context list available, these names are not going to be this friendly. So what I like to do is I'll run this command to read them all into a variable called context. Remember, you only have to do this once. This is cached on the machine as well. So I can close, reopen. It's going to remember this. Now, I could look at the first one. And what you kind of do is go through all of them. OK, so context zero is Savile Tech Dev. I could look at context one. Run that command. Okay, that's Savile Tech Prod. The next one. Okay, that's Savile Tech Lab. So I have a bunch of the different ones. And then once I know what they are, I just rename them. Element one, two, whatever your names would be. And then you get these much more friendly names like I've got here. So I can super easily switch between my dev, prod, and lab. I could even take out the name Savile Tech. I could just have dev, prod, lab. And I could jump between them super, super easy. But we can essentially see, hey, now I can just jump between them. Hey, I want to select my production. I want to select my lab. I just type the command. There's this get az context auto save setting. So that's what controls when I create these. It shows me where it's saving them. And then also, and you can see like the cache file, the cache directory, and if it's actually doing this save. If it wasn't, you can do enable az context auto save oh what did i just do there i hit the wrong key let's get back again enable az context auto save so now between sessions it's going to keep it i can clear them but i don't want to do that what if remember is this fantastic uh, functionality in powershell that says well what would you do if i ran this command not that i actually want to do that but essentially at this point, I have got the module, I have authenticated, and I'm working in whatever context I want, whatever subscription where I have the resources I care about. 
that's great on my machine. Now there's also things like Docker images. There's a Docker image out there that has kind of the, the Azure module pre-installed. Now I drew this kind of thing over here that, hey, I'm working in Azure. And we talked about the portal and we kind of talked about some interactions between them. Well, the portal actually has this great thing called the cloud shell. And that cloud shell can be PowerShell or Bash. Remember, these are both Linux. So the cloud shell is always Linux. It's actually creating a container behind the scenes. And I can really select, well, uh, do I want to focus around using PowerShell or do I want more of the Bash, which we think about more as the CLI. But the great thing about this cloud shell is it has the modules, it has the latest Azure CLI, it has the latest AZ module just there for you. Also, it's going to authenticate you with whatever account I'm currently authenticated to the browser as. So if I'm just kind of on some random machine and I want to quickly just get to PowerShell or the CLI and just do some commands quickly, well, if we jump over to the portal, if I go back just to home for a second, let's close that down. See this little icon up here at the top? If I click that, you'll see it's opening up. I have PowerShell, I could also do Bash. Notice it has the AZ CLI available as well. So I can absolutely do kind of AZ, let's see what my version is. So I have the AZ CLI as well. So it, this is just really what I want to write things in. Is it PowerShell? Um, is it the Bash? But I, I have access to both of them the AZ CLI and the PowerShell module. If I do get module AZ list available, and there's that latest AZ module. And I can at this point just do get um, AZ resource group format table. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to authenticate. I'm just there. I can also just go to shell .azure.com. So if I don't want the rest of the portal, if I just want to quickly spin up a shell, well, I can go to shell.azure.com. Notice I have exactly the same options, and I can go nuts. I can just do this from within here. Now, the other nice thing this has, and I can run this locally as well, there are PowerShell providers. If I do a get PS provider, these are some of the providers I have available. And you'll notice you have this ships one down the bottom. You have ships and it's Azure. Now ships is this simple hierarchy in PowerShell. It lets you walk various types of resources as if it was a file system. My subscriptions, my resource groups, my objects. So that is just baked in to this shell. So I can actually move to Azure. So from here, I could do CD Azure. I could do DIR. And now I can see my subscriptions. I could go CD Savile Tech, oh, if I could type, dev subscription, and then DIR. Well, now I can see I've got different resource groups. So I could go CD resource groups, DIR. There's all my resource groups. Okay, CD, RG, that, oh, wrong one. Uh, I think it's USA, there we go. Okay, so then within here, I've got this whole bunch of different things. So I could go into Microsoft.Storage, DIR, and then I have storage accounts. So basically, I'm traversing my ARM resources as if it was a file system. So that's what this ships provider does. Now I'm gonna be honest, uh, I don't really use this very much. Um, but if you just want to kind of browse around, if you're kind of new to this stuff, uh, it, it might be kind of useful to go in. But the key point is it's just available to me. Additionally, one of the nice things this has as well, imagine I wanted to actually do some editing, I can just open up, there's kind of a special version of code so if I just do code dot, this is built on the open source Monaco editor. If I do code dot, 
it actually opens up kind of like this VS Code environment where I could now go and I could see the various files I have, I could create new files, I could edit them. It's just a great little editor in that Cloud Shell. I can hit the kind of three dots here in the top right, and then I could close it, open other files, open a command palette, really anything I want to do. So it, it really is this, this powerful environment uh, that I can leverage. So yes, I use PowerShell most of the time on my local machine, but don't forget if I'm ever in some kind of environment and I just have access to a browser and I, I quickly want to run a couple of commands, hey, hey, go and open the Cloud Shell. Also like the Azure app on your phone, I can get access to that shell and I quickly do a little bit of PowerShell or CLI um, to do those things. So it's a, a little bit, I just want to make sure you're aware of that kind of Cloud Shell environment. So yes, I have all these different things but just remember, kind of I do have kind of the Cloud Shell for that super easy access that brings all of those things together. And then ultimately, uh, uh, do stuff. <laughs> uh, you've, you've got the module, you've authenticated once, now you've got that rolling 90 day window. I, if I have multiple subscriptions, pick the context and I can always switch between them. Now I just want to do stuff. Now, in terms of, well, what am I going to do? The easiest way to kind of get started is remember, Azure really is all around that least cognitive distance. So I can think about, well, what is it I want to do? And then what would I actually do to solve that? So I can do a get command. And then I could look at a particular module. So let's say AZ resources, and then show me all of the nouns, remember they're the types of object, and then sort it. So if I run this command, these are all of the nouns, i.e. the types of resource, available in the az.resources module. And one of the things I'm gonna see here is things like resource group. That's obviously one of the big ones, first things we ever do. And I could see, well, what are the commands for resource group. Okay, well I can export, get them, create a new one, remove them, um, set it. I could run a command. So here I'm doing get az resource group. And now I'm using FT and the reason it's complaining is in scripts you shouldn't use kind of shorthand aliases, it doesn't like it. So one of the things um, it's kind of saying is, hey look, you really shouldn't do this, stop it, that's bad. It wants me to replace it with kind of format table like that. Because it's saying, hey, FT was an alias, don't do those things. But now I'm using that, so I'm gonna look at all my resource groups, and then I was saying, hey, I just wanna see the resource group name and the location, and then I'm, I'm getting that data. I could do other things. Um, for example, now I'm gonna change, so I'm gonna do Select AZ context. I'm going to jump over to my prod. That's all I had to do. Now I'm going to say, well, let's look at my virtual machines. And hey, there's, there's all my VMs I have. Now remember, regular PowerShell applies here. The pipeline is super powerful in PowerShell. The point of the pipeline is with regular scripting, I run a command what I get out is a text string. So it really limits what I can do with that. With PowerShell, what it outputs are objects. So I can pass those objects to another command. It can then look at all of the different aspects of the objects, the functions with the objects, pass it to something else. So it lets me have this pipeline to pass those objects down so I can do really complex things in a very, very simple command. So in this case, what I'm actually gonna do is I can think about, well, I want to see if the VM is running. So on top of get az VM, I add dash status. So if I just ran this without the rest of it, so I'm pushing F8, well now I can see the actual power state. So the power state says kind of VM running, VM deallocated, VM running, etc. So what I could now do is, well, I'm going to pass this get status. Notice I had a command here that just shows it 
in a basic kind of output. I'm going to pass it to a where object command where the power state does not equal VM running. So that shows me the ones that are deallocated. And then I could pass those to start AZ VM. Now I'm doing what if, so it's not actually going to do anything. But what it's showing me is, hey, this one command would get a list of all my VMs, find the ones that aren't running, and start them. So very, very easy. I can do things I already showed you, the get AZ environment. I can look at all of the regions. So get AZ location will show me all of the regions available, what providers they have. I could look at things like, well, what VM sizes are allowed in South Central US? Okay. I could see, well, what is my usage in South Central US? What is my current value? And I'm sorting these in a descending order. So I can see, well, total regional virtual CPUs, 15 out of 100. I'm using 10 for the BS series. I've got eight virtual machines. I've got premium managed disks. So it's really super cool what I can do with a PowerShell. I'm actually going to store that region as a variable. I can look at templates. So if I actually was doing, now again, I don't really want to do provisioning in PowerShell. Because again, it's not item potent, it's not declarative, but there, there may be times you do. Maybe you're just not ready for templates yet. I like scripting. It's still better than trying to do it in the portal, which is manual, you click things wrong. At least with a script, I can put it into a version control system like Git. Um, and I, I hit some level of consistency between executions instead of making sure I click the right buttons the right way. But even if I'm just investigating what's available, maybe I'm not creating it here, I want to see, well, what templates are available? So what I'm doing in here is, hey, show me all the image publishers for kind of South Central, and there's a lot of them. And then I can kind of say, okay, well, what are all of the image offers? Let's cancel that. For Microsoft Windows Server. Okay, there's a whole bunch of those. Um, which ones, actually this is for the Windows Server one, and then which ones for 2019 Data Core, and I can see all the different versions that I could then go and use. I can do things like, well, what are the various Azure VM extensions that are available? And there's a lot of them. I can interface with the Azure Resource Graph, and that's phenomenally powerful. Remember, the resource graph gives me kind of sub-second access. Of course, any subscription I have access to, regardless of really how much resource, it's a lot more efficient. If I was trying to write a PowerShell script to find all the VMs, then get these properties about the VMs, doing get AZ VM, and then it's very inefficient. It's going to be very, very slow. Whereas the resource graph is going to be super fast. So I can call the resource graph from my PowerShell script, which is what I'm doing here. So in this script, what I actually do is I'm trying to find a particular virtual machine based on the guest OS name. So here I'm doing a computer name. And this is a separate module, AZ Resource Graph. So you'd have to do an install module, AZ Resource Graph. So I'm setting a computer name. And I'm creating a search query. So I'm looking for any resource that's a virtual machine where the OS profile computer name, either guest name is that name, and I'm joining it with the subscription list. So it's actually going to tell me the subscription it's in as well. So I can actually create that bunch of code. And then I'm just going to try and run it. So I'm using the search AZ graph and calling that query that I've defined up here. And if I run that, watch. OK, so that would normally work. Uh, it's some token weirdness with the tenant where I actually have the resources. But I promise you that normally would work and show you the resources. But being able to interface with that resource graph is kind of a super useful thing to do. Deploying ARM templates. Now, my Azure Masterclass, I go into a massive detail about that. But over here, you can do like a new AZ resource group deployment. But essentially, there's documentation on anything you want to do. Now, I can go and find the command. So if I know I'm doing something about virtual machines, I want to do a new VM, well, I can do a get command. It's going to be in the AZ compute module. And it's showing me all the different commands that have the word VM in them. So OK, there's a new AZ VM. And then I can say, well, get help dash examples. 
And it's going to show me all the different ways I can use new Azure VM. I could say, well, get help online. And it will open up a browser and show me the new AZ VM with all the documentation, all the examples of how to use it. If I didn't know what I was doing, I could say, well, a Azure PowerShell um, create storage account. Chances are, okay, create Azure storage account, create a storage account, and here it shows me, well, portal, PowerShell, CLI, template, and then creating it in the portal, PowerShell, CLI. And that really applies to everything. So I, I see zero point in me now trying to go through a whole bunch of different commands for creating a storage account. Um, the documentation's there. The key point when you're getting started with PowerShell is more about, well, what do I want to do in terms of the installation, the authentication, those contexts, and where you want to use it. I think a PowerShell is phenomenally powerful for maybe doing quick interactions, seeing what's there, starting, stopping, doing management. I tend to try and avoid it for provisioning because it's not idempotent, it's not declarative, but you could. When I started out, I definitely did create things with PowerShell. It's just it's better for you longer term to think about templates for that stuff. But for automation, for management actions, the PowerShell, the CLI is super powerful. So I hope that was useful. Again, the, the file that I've used here, um, that's linked below in the description of the video, it's in my random stuff GitHub repo. Um, remember that it does update fairly frequently. So you would just go through, you can go and check and just remove the old one, install the new one. If this was useful, a like, subscribe, uh, comment and share is appreciated. There's a lot of work goes into creating these. But essentially, um, good luck. If you're not sure what something's gonna do, add that what if, or at least confirm to make sure you go, go and do something super bad. Um, but until next time, take care.